Hi, my name is Tim and I've been to Holland and I've done an interview with Hans Tendam, who is one of the world's leading regression therapists. The first thing I read from him was an article comparing six different approaches to regression therapy. A very interesting article. I will link it in the comments. And then after that article, I wanted to know more and I got his book, Deep Healing. I started to use some of the suggestions in his book in my work and I noticed that this really improved my work in uh, some cases. So I started his international training program in Holland. So now that you have some context for the interview, I hope that is helpful. Make sure after watching it to check out the links in the description of the video. Enjoy. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for taking the time to answer some questions. The way I got in touch uh, with you and I, I learned about you is I was um, I found your article about um, comparing different approaches of um, regression therapy and um, so maybe you, you could uh, start by explaining um, what's different about regression therapy compared to other approaches of psychotherapy. There is a book, a pocket book, I believe it's from 1980, uh -huh. giving a list of all psychotherapies in alphabetical order and there are uh, more than 250 of them. Okay. So, and of course many of them have a different twist on, but are very similar to others. So the question is compared to what? Um, the best thing I can say is what my clients tell me that have been to other therapies. What do they tell you? Well, of course, not so very good things, because if they would have been helped, they wouldn't come to me. Yes. So that may be true for every specialism. You get a negative selection. But what they tell me usually, it's a lot of talking and listening, and more talking and more listening, and more talking and more listening. And as one of them told me, said, when I asked him, okay, what did you get out of that? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, basically, I can talk easier about my problems. Yes. Well, that's not enough, right? No. I was so taken aback when he said that. that I told him, well, part of my diagnosis I have already. You're stupid. <laughs> I mean, not everything works, and even what we do. And I think I'm a good therapist. It doesn't work always. Yeah. Um, but after, if not after one time, after two or three times, you know if this is going to work or not. And some things may work slow, but you should sense progress. So the main difference is that we not only talk and listen, but we have people reliving things, mm -hmm. which means that they more or less experience it in the now, in a mixture of the person that they are right now and, for example, the child they have been before. But we try to get them as much as possible into the situation. Th mm -hmm. That's regression. That's 50% of regression. It's reliving. The other 50% is getting the story straight. Mm. Um, if you're afraid, and there's no real immediate reason to be afraid. If it's a phobia, um, it always started somewhere. So regression is always going where did it start? And sometimes, and how got it worse? There may be stages in the development. I don't care what they feel, they feel depressed. Of course, that's very vague. We try to get it more specific, but we go back to the first time they felt that specific type of depression. What is special about it is that if you do that, 
you often come into experiences that most people, and certainly most psychologists, would consider um, unreal, like experiences in the, in the womb, mm -hmm. before you've been born. How do we know if it's true? Well, we not all, always know if it's true, but sometimes we get confirmation. But the basic thing, of course, is that doing that will resolve a problem. And with resolving, I mean resolving. Yes. That the fear is gone, or the depression is gone. That you feel a different person. And most spectacularly, when people have had their whole life, as long as they can remember, a certain feeling, that they may say, at the end of a session, I didn't know it is possible to feel this way. Mm. And then, of course, it should stay. And I must say one of the most, I think, uncommon, I guess uncommon results from regression therapy, that if you do uh, a recheck after some time, that the more time has passed, the more positive the results are. Yes. Because usually you expect, of course, that people are very glad after some time and then it it wears off. But I've seen at least two different researchers that have been longitudinal or about a long time, so let's say after one month, three months, half a year, a year, that the farther you go, the more positive the people become. Yeah. So that's also, I would say, a big difference. Yeah. And um, so this reliving is key to um, to that, that really a change happens, that really healing takes place in your experience. Yes. Yeah. There are people, I believe they come usually from hypnotherapy, that say you should never relive a trauma because it's re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. That is bull. Mm. Bull as in bullshit. Yes, that's, okay. I wouldn't say that. But yes, absolutely. Because we know all the time that if you really relive it, it is liberating. Yeah. It depends a little bit on how you relive it. It depends yeah. a little bit on the, on the therapist. But pretty often, the simple fact that people start to relive it, and in all its horrible glory, mm -hmm. is, is a catharsis, yeah. is liberation. Um, and also, what's important, people should not only be rid of the problems, they should understand why the problems were there in the first place. Yes. For if you have a fear, and I do something pop, 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 with you, and the fear is gone. Fantastic. But you have no idea where the fear came from, and you have no idea why it's gone now. There will always be a little voice in your mind it may come back one day. Yeah. And those little voices are very naughty. They can even recreate a problem yeah. if you're not careful. How about this idea? I'm, I'm not sure if I read it in your book or if I got it somewhere else. This idea that healing is self-healing. Is it something you would, you would agree to? Or? Yes. I would even say there's no other healing. Yeah. And of course the therapist is a conductor, mm. can be very helpful, can be even essential, but it's temporarily essential. And it's helping a client that no matter what you feel right now, you will come through. But of course it's self-healing. If it's not self-healing, yeah. it is either temporarily or it's not as deep. Yeah. Now let's assume there are persons that may be in a condition they don't have the mind power to heal themselves. And there are other people that may help them, and some of them will make passes over them, or they will pray to the angels. Mm. And that's not my style, I don't like that. But if it works, it works. Mm. But if a person is able to work himself, herself, that is always the first choice. Yeah. Okay, and so of course, 
because of that helping the client to understand where it comes from it's also empowering for the client yeah yeah so you, you should come out of the session or out of the therapy not only with your problem solved but stronger yes more vital yeah a good therapy is rejuvenating yes okay i remember the woman i once met after a few months after some sessions i asked how she was doing she said the first month was wonderful and then it went back a little bit yeah. but it was temporarily because yesterday my friend told me my god you look so radiant it's like you come out of a regression session <laughs> so ladies it's rejuvenating and some guys may want to hear this too okay good to know which means by the way that it's not only the mind it's not only the soul, the feelings, however you want to call it, it's also the body. Yes. The body is very important, at least in the way that I work in regression therapy. So you mentioned your approach to regression therapy. I read in this article, um, the first thing I read from you was this article with where you, I, I think you compared maybe seven different approaches to regression therapy. Oh, six different, yes. Six. Um, so what's the difference between your approach, um, which you, I think you call transpersonal regression therapy, what's the mm -hmm. difference between your approach and these other approaches? For example, I'm um, familiar with the approach uh, of Brian Jameson and mm -hmm. Jan-Erik Sigdell, which is kind of the yeah. same. And also I read a lot of um, Brian Weiss. Yes. Um, but there are also other approaches. Uh, so what's the difference? Uh, you want me in general or with these people? Because these people are not that different from what I do. Okay. I then I think there are differences, but, but then not maybe, that deep. Then maybe first in general and then we can look yeah, at those it's two. Some people think if you simply relive what happened before, mm -hmm. that's or no, even worse, that if you know where your problems come from, because somebody tells you, Mm -hmm. the psychic mm -hmm. and it once you know that's enough yeah i think with due respect that's rubbish yeah um, then there are people who say well you should not only relive it but if it's still emotional you should repeat 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 and repeat till there is no more charge as we say mm -hmm. till you can remember it that works, it's an awful way, and I think it's a stupid way. It's just, okay, you, let's assume you relive 16 times a rape, and now you can remember it and there are no more emotions attacked. It means that part of you has become insensitive. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call that therapy. Mm -hmm. Although it may help in daily life, but in a sense, I think people are worse off. Mm. Um, so the kind of therapy, of regression therapy, that I practice, I advocate, is called cathartic. Mm -hmm. There should be catharsis. And catharsis, an intellectual catharsis, is understanding. Suddenly understanding, oh, that's what happened. Oh, that's the reason that is part of catharsis. Another part of catharsis is that your emotions change, that your fear is gone, yeah. that your sadness is gone, that your anger is gone, at least in all its intensity. Yeah. Um, and the third, and maybe I wouldn't say the most essential, but well, it's basic, is it should be a physical catharsis. Yes you should feel differently in your body. Especially, of course, with uh, psychosomatic problems, chronic fatigue. At the end of the sessions, the chronic fatigue should be gone. Yes. It should be considerably less, but even that would probably be not real healing. It's gone. It's yes. over. It's okay. past. I feel, compared to what I felt before, wonderful, also physically. And there's 
One other resp uh, difference with another school is that, which call themselves usually past life therapists, that often in regression you go back to a past life. In my case, in my experience, about between one third and one half of the cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's representative. And some people say you have to go there, otherwise the therapy is not complete. Mm -hmm. I understand why they're saying it, they may be often right, but in general I think also it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. The trauma in this life can be so deep that that's where your problem is. Mm -hmm. And if you heal that, you healed. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're young, for example, you're eight years old, you're in school, and people make fun of you, you feel wounded. You mm. feel. But if the wound is so deep that it, it hurts you for the rest of your life, that's a bit strange. Yeah. And then you find that there is a reason for it, that it hurt you so much. But some hurts simply start in this life, mm. absolutely. If you have a, a veteran who has had some horrible experiences in war, you have to go to those experiences. Yes. You don't go to past lives. Yeah, that makes yeah. There it makes total sense. Even yeah. if you have this extreme. Yeah. Anyway, you don't go further than necessary to heal the problem. Yeah. You mentioned a little earlier that it's kind of not your way to pray to angels to ask angels for help. Yeah. So. Um, Brian Weiss, he, he writes about that in his regression sessions he uh, sometimes encountered entities that he calls the masters, who are some kind of uh, higher developed beings that are yeah. helpful yeah. and that he can ask for advice during, during the sessions in some mm -hmm. way. Um, and um, with uh, Jan-Erik Siegdell, what I learned there is that um, we work um, with a higher self and also in some situations um, Jan-Erik uh, showed us how to call for intervention or ask for angels to appear, for example, in, in case if you have dem demonic entities yeah. to um, take them with them, kind of like that. Yeah. So what's, what's your approach to to this, this kind of work? My approach or my opinion? But Both. My approach, what I do. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I think I can pretty surely say that I never, ever felt the need of a master or an angel or mm -hmm. higher self, not even that. Do you think these exist at all or are they just constructions? <laughs> It would be nice to have a very clear good answer. My guess is, no, let me put it this way. I have no reason to assume it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. My guess is it exists. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very slippery. It's very, very easy to make things up. Mm -hmm. I, I need help. Okay. What I'm calling up. Let's assume there are spirits Maybe you get busybodies. People said, oh. Well, what, what do you uh, mean by busybodies? I'm not um, dead persons that uh, want to feel important. Okay. Oh. The only thing I can say that sometimes people working in a session, they get into experiences that can be, you can only call them mystical. Mm -hmm. Something larger is there, but it's something larger of the person that is really there working, seeing, experiencing, and they may feel that something is opening up. And I accept that. It's like almost a religious experience, mm. but I don't, I accept it as a dessert. Mm. I will not accept it as a main dish. Mm. There are only two people that are necessary and essential in the whole universe. It's the client and the therapist. Mm. And is, does, it, does it also connect to the idea to empower the client? And then if you, if you ask help from some another source, you're not empowering the client? Absolutely. Yeah. 
the client may come out with the feeling that uh, oh when I have a real tr uh, in problem I have to pray mm. and people that pray in church does that help my guess is yes it often really helps mm. and my guess is more often it doesn't help at all mm. and my guess is sometimes it worsens the situation mm. it depends on the state of mind you do those things mm. but any way any time you need something outside yourself the side effect is apparently what I need is not inside myself mm. so I wouldn't say it is forbidden to ask for outside help it's a second second uh, choice yes. or even worse than a second choice the first choice is the client helps the second choice would be that and I don't like that that the therapist is helping and and then there's a whole time nothing and then the third choice is to ask something else yeah. okay, I see. maybe another question around kind of the differences the method I learned uh, with Jan Erik was one where including the higher self is, yes. a, is an important method. So, and at certain key points, you ask the higher self for for an answer, for an input. And the idea is, the way I got it, is that the higher self is kind of, it's in a way you, but it's kind of this more conscious version of you. That's your yeah. potential, and that's it's kind you of you plus. You plus, that's not fully incarnated yet, but it could be kind of like like this. It's, um, is this something you, you also work with? No. And why not? Well, first of all, I don't see the need. Mm. When it works, it works. So, I'm not saying that people who work with the higher selves, like Jan Eric, don't have effective sessions. I'm mm. not saying that. What I don't like about it is when you talk about the higher self, when you address the higher self, ipso facto, because of that, you consider the client who's paying you as a lower self. Yes. I would rather say there is more to you than meets the eye. It's more to you than you realize you are. Let me give an example. Somebody feels small, mm -hmm. belittled. Then, in regression therapy, you go back to the original experiences of being belittled. Mm -hmm. Now, once you understand that, and there may be a lot of emotion coming up, and understanding, and acceptance, and what have you, then you may say, okay, maybe you are much bigger than you thought you were. Mm -hmm. Just, just imagine, just feel, basically I'm much bigger than it was. How do that feel? Oh, I feel that gives me, mm, I, I don't know how to express. Okay, grow. Mm. Feel yourself growing. Oh, yes, but I'm already at the, at the roof. Don't worry, grow. And they grow and they have an immense experiences. Mm. And you may call it the higher self, but at no point you use the word higher self. You tell the person, grow. Mm -hmm. This is a crazy and idiotic instruction, but it works wonderful. Mm. Assume your original size. Mm. Yeah. And that may bring people into, into mystical experiences. Yeah. But they experience that they are much bigger than they thought they were. Yeah. That they are much wider than they were, and if you want to say that they are higher than they yeah. thought they were, but I'm not making a dichotomy between this is the ordinary yeah. self and this is the higher self. It's, it's kind of sometimes like you're higher, sometimes yeah. you're lower. I have a very low self. I'm not going to do that now. No, uh, no way. Yeah. But I have a lower self too, of course. That's also me. Yeah. It's also this you are already it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, calling up the higher self may work. Mm -hmm. It usually works. But it it you don't get the same quality of results. Mm -hmm. And there is always the possibility of that you 
increase ego weaknesses, ego inflation. Yes. Um, well, there are a lot of ego problems. And if you talk about higher self, some people may feel like this, and other people feel, oh, I need. If it's difficult, I need my higher self, and yeah. yeah. And then you solve one problem and creating another one. It seems kind of you're kind of the secular approach. You have the secular approach to regression therapy, and um, yeah, yeah. I think not at all. But anyway. Okay, interesting. Um, because Jan Erik, Jan Erik Sigdell, he has kind of his his approach is very and probably also that of Brian Jameson, uh, is very connected to this uh, Christian uh, Gnostic. Um, as far as I know, view. it's typically for him, not for Brian Jameson, okay. not at all. Okay, uh, interesting. Okay, but I know that of him. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not Christian at all. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So in that uh, worldview, um, there's some kind of. Uh, I'm, I think there, there's something really charming about that because uh, it gives. Really, what's charming? Charming. It's yes. something charming about because it gives you kind of this whole. Um, it gives a certain security because it gives this whole concept of the world, kind of yeah. what's going on, you know? Uh, why are we here? What's going on? And it's, it's kind of these things I explained. And um, one thing that I noticed about him is that in, in um, the therapy, forgiveness is very important. Sure. So, so there's the idea that um, we will reincarnate again and again as long as there's somebody left we have a, a quarrel with. It's a horrible idea, but anyway, I, I know the idea. It's, it's He's not the only one. There's so also, there are, there are Indian. Yeah. Philosophies that more or less are the same. Yes. Yeah. So you try. So so this is why when you do um, what you call personification, that you kind of uh, have a dialogue with uh, different mm. persons. Mm -hmm. um, you always aim to go for forgiveness from both sides because this is recognized as so important. So um, let me put it very clear. Mm -hmm. I don't care shit about forgiveness. Okay. Is that clear enough? That's pretty clear, yeah. Now, I should clarify, of course, why I say that. Yeah. It's not 100% true, but it's 90% true. Forgiveness does not help a thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the reason for forgiveness, why people think that way, is pretty clear. Think of vendettas. Mm. I'm angry at you. I hit you, you try to hit me, I will hit you, yet you can go on till you see blue in the face. And at some time it's better to say, turn the other cheek, than hit back. Hmm. But turn the other cheek is very often not a very good recipe. Hmm. If you're in the street and people rob you, you should be angry, or even better, you should stop them. Hmm. And it doesn't help to, when they take all your passport and all your belongings with them to say, I forgive you, nobody's better. Off is that. Hmm. What I go for is understanding. Now it's possible that the guy who robs you, maybe even the guy who rapes you, has a story. And maybe it's possible to understand that story. But right now, if you see a person raping the girl from the neighbor, you don't go for forgiveness, you don't go for the story, you go to stop it. Mm. And once you stopped it, then you can say, okay, now maybe we find out how did this guy become a rapist? And certainly we don't tell the victim. You have to understand him. You have to, no. You have to resolve the situation. Now, if there's very often, if there's real understanding, forgiveness comes in free. Yes. It's a kind of extra, it's a, prim it's, it's a natural byproduct of understanding, really understanding. So it may come to the same point in the end. But if you forgive before understanding, yeah. and what happens very often, because you don't want to look inside and see how 
terribly angry you are, mm. and that you really want to kill someone, that you have murder instinct inside yourself, you don't forgive. Mm. No. That does not help at all. It only packages the unexpressed anger, the unexpressed, uh, how do you call it, uh, despair sometimes. Mm. Sometimes you don't understand how is it possible that if there is a good God that these terrible things are happening. I'm, I'm, I'm actually so angry with God that what should I never feel, I should not ever think about it. I should forgive, forgive. Many of these people that are full of forgiveness, they are full of physical complaints mm. because there is so much anger and other emotions are suppressed. suppressed yeah, okay, I see. So, I don't, how do you call it, I don't advise revenge and I don't advise forgiveness. I advise first to stop mm. whatever horrible is happening and secondly to find out how it can be prevented yes. and thirdly to find out how could it go come this way. Mm. And then, as I said, Forgiveness may, may be thrown in for free. Mm. Mm. Oh, last thing. Yeah. If I forgive you, I'm better than you. That's yeah. why it's horrible to be forgiven. Because you have now you have to be grateful to the other side. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that side of it too. I'm overstating a bit, yeah. but not too much, I guess. So how about this idea, and you will say that's philosophy, would you agree to the idea that there's kind of an evolution of consciousness and we as humans evolve? I see the whole interview is going the way to philosophy and not to therapy. That there is a development, absolutely. And is it something therapy can help with, to connect it to therapy? <laughs> absolutely. Um, so um, it's a fast track for evolution. Yeah, this kind of therapy, huh? That is finding out. It's not only solving the problem; it's finding out why the problem was there, how it developed, and why it has not been solved up till now. To understand all that, that's a large part of evolution. Yes. So, and this this goes for every being. Every being is on this evolution. Well. First of all, I didn't have every person on earth on my therapy couch. Okay, so you can. So try. this is. If there is evolution, there is also degeneration possible. So it's certainly not for every being. So it can be that some that somebody is really lost and won't be recovered. People hate that idea. I cannot prove it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. Mm. Okay. So you, yeah. So you would also give up on if you can encounter a being like that in, in therapy, maybe as an attachment or something. You would also, there would be a point where you, you would give up on that being when you say, okay. Well, first of all, of point. course, that's not the way you start. Yeah. By far not. But it's a possibility that you you have to say uh, no. Mm. That. Uh, there is, there is something which we call a bit vaguely free will. There is no responsibility. And of course, you cannot see all the things, you cannot forecast everything. So I can have a wrong impression, I can have a wrong idea. Mm. So I am not the one who is going to say definitely. But I think it is pretty clear to me, but only to very few of my colleagues, they have different opinions on that, but that is possible to degenerate and become what I call subcritical. Subcritical. That there is not enough soul left to inhabit a new body. Okay. And then what happens? What do you think happens to people? At I that think point? whatever is eternal will go back to the to the origin, will be dissolved. But the entity, the ego, the the, the identity, I should say, I think will be erased. Mm -hmm. Apparently the gods didn't didn't create us perfect. 
and I believe even it would be nonsense to create a perfect being. I think even the concept of being perfect is nonsense, but that's that's philosophy again. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because you know it it seems it always takes these two sides. You know, it's, it it seems to take the imperfection also to go to get to the perfection. You know, you don't get to the perfection. Or you to go to a less. To go you go to, to a richer to or, to or wider like yeah. or more comprehensive reality or consciousness, whatever. Mm -hmm. There will be growth, there will be development, there will be transformation. But I think the whole idea that there's an end to that, you see, that there is an end to that is impossible to picture. That there is no end to that is also impossible to picture. Mm -hmm. Don't picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like Martin Buber wrote when he was 14 years old that he was trying to imagine would the universe have an end? Like, it ends here. And you cannot imagine that because there will be something else. So, you cannot imagine it as an end. Mm. And you can also not imagine that it has no end. Mm. So, you should stop trying, <laughs> trying that. Yeah. Apparently, your mind in its present state, maybe in another state it's possible to understand that, and maybe in another state there will be other things you can't understand. Now, this is philosophy at its worst. Yeah. You also do this um, live review uh, stage sometimes. Sometimes. And, and you also sometimes, sometimes, sometimes yeah. do this life planning. Sometimes, yes. And from your experience um, in doing these two, kind of uh, um, review of the life, a planning of the life, is there kind of a, a common theme from clients, kind of... Um, that kind of tells you what usually is kind of the purpose. Um, but what's kind of the general purpose people have in their lives? If you kind of summarize the um, life preparation. I think places. life is not so poor that there is a purpose. A purpose from whom? Of whom? Why not many purposes? Why not a mixture of purposes and? But is there kind of like a common theme like development or learning? Listen, of course, but that theme is so general, yeah. it doesn't have any taste, it doesn't have, it has hardly meaning. Uh, so in a session, will I send people to life planning? Usually not. Mm. I will keep it open. For example, people want to know, why have I been born in this family? I would say, go back to a place and time that will explain you why you were born in this family. Mm. And they may go to a kind of planning, and they may go to karma, and they may find out that there was no planning at all, or that they have been come back so hurriedly that they just stumbled into something. Mm. Now, there are people who say, yes. That's what they think. But behind that are the people, are higher beings who... Well, you can explain everything like that. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's you can explain everything. I, I cannot say that's not true, yeah. but I don't think we should have a general conclusion on that. We should stay with... I learn from my clients. I try to give the, ex the my ex instructions as open as possible. And by the way, I discover new things sometimes. And sometimes they say something and I think, hmm, what's this? Hmm, I leave it open. And two years later you get another person who says, oh, I remember. Oh, now I see a kind of pattern. Could be this. Now, and in the time of years, if you're lucky, some of these things, they fit together. Yeah. And you get some pictures, but the pictures are never... That's why I dislike philosophy, because before you know it is a play on words. Yeah. I want to stick to things that are sensible in the practice of our work. And that gives a wide vista, yeah. wider than most people have. And we should try to overdo that and to generalize that. Yeah. So, in many respects, I would say, okay, keep an open mind and uh, 
I'm pretty convinced of some things, but I'm also convinced that it's always wise never to be convinced for 100%. Yeah. And even if you can convince of something, it's possible that later you get a, just a different view on things and yeah. that you see a different perspective. Yeah. To, to just keep some openness all the time. Yeah. Yes. It also gives respect to my clients that I don't want to... I try out things with them and very often they have wonderful uh, consequences. Mm. And sometimes they don't work and you try something else. And, mm. and sometimes they give answers and I say, hmm, that seems to me very unlikely. But still I have an open mind that maybe I see this wrong. And so I try to give new suggestions or new questions. And sometimes you find out, oh, it was half true or it was true in a different way, whatever. Yeah. So let me just give one example. Somebody just sent me a session. Oh, the client uh, feels himself to be a white bubble mm. who is sent into the darkness to, to learn, understand the darkness so it could work better uh, with souls that were affected with the darkness, something like that. And then the bubble goes on and the bubble goes into the darkness, forget to get out of the darkness and then get some darkness inside and therefore that bubble is now a person that has problems in his life. Mm. What can I say about it? Not very much. A a apart from these very general bubbles. Can I say that person has never been a bubble? No, I can't say that. Maybe it was a bubble, maybe the bubble is a kind of, how do you call it, steno, a kind of shorthand for an experience. But what I want to know, okay, if the client cell sees a bubble, go to a time and a place that will uh, show you the, the, how you came from a bubble to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And if they don't go there, don't want to go there, I leave it at that, but I don't continue sessions with them. Mm. You have to get the story straight. Yeah. Okay. I'm repeating myself. So if, um, if people who are therapists or are learning to be a therapist, if they want to learn your approach, what would be, the, what would be good first steps to do that? First step, of course, is um, experience this kind of work yourself, mm -hmm. a few sessions, go to an introduction, weekend, day, evening, whatever there is, that's of course the first step. Mm -hmm. This most recent book of yours would also be a good introduction probably, Transpersonal, that's, I think the subtitle is Transpersonal Regression Therapy, what's the, what's uh, the manual, it, it's, it's uh, called Deep Healing and Transformation. Deep Healing and Transformation, yeah. Um, it's not a beginner's book or? No, no, no it's, it's not a beginner's book. It's for book. therapists, it's a manual for therapists. It's a manual for therapists. Mm. Now, some people may just read it from out of interest, yeah. but my guess is an, as an introduction, that's too complicated, yes. Yeah. Which brings me to the fact that I don't know of any introduction. There are books that are more of an introduction type, but, mm. but I doubt if there's a good introduction. So maybe just doing sessions yourself as a, as a client, it's a good way to ex first experience it and then you know. Maybe. If you don't like it, stop it. Yeah. If you like it, try a bit more. It's the same as everything else in the... And then for uh, introductory courses, uh, your institute is also offering introductory weekends or something like that? Or Very often weekends, lately also simply days. Yeah. Also in English or just in Dutch? Not in English, no. Okay. And in English, you're, but in English... Because we have, an we have an international group. Yeah. You cannot have for a weekend people fly in from... Of course. Yeah. And they even don't know if this is what they want, etc. Um, there are, of course, English introductions, but they are at the moment in India mm -hmm. and some other countries, yeah. not here in Holland. No. 
and then you offer this international course which I'm doing right now which, which is uh, I think six modules six times six seminars or five days yes yeah. mm -hmm. 30 days which yeah. in fact is pretty short mm -hmm. I think one-third of the book is not covered for example mm -hmm. but okay so is there anything else I haven't asked, but that would fit into what we were talking about today? That you also want to Well, mention? there's a fundamental thing in the way we work, the way I work. Mm -hmm. We call it res regression therapy. And we call it transpersonal because doing this therapy, you come in things that are beyond the present personality. Like influence of entities uh, that most psychologists and psychiatrists will consider to be uh, fantasies mm. or even uh, bring people away from reality mm. uh, delusional they get delusional etc yeah uh, the only point is of course that with those delusions we all the time heal people largely or completely from things that they are not healed of by any psychiatrist or psychologist. Mm. So we we'll still will go on with that. Maybe that's a good way to sum up. There are some issues that in general we have a very high success rate and there are some problems that we have a much lower success rate. Mm. What are your most successful? What our highest success rate is in everything related to fear and phobias. Mm -hmm. Everything what's called depression, mm. low energy, psychosomatic problems, mm. and somewhat less, but also let's call it relationship problems, mm -hmm. including sexual problems, specific relation problems, problems related to people in general. Yeah. We are not so good at things that have to do with compulsive obsessive disorders mm -hmm. and with um, addictions. Mm -hmm. We have some good results, but less. Mm -hmm. And there are some psychiatric conditions like hearing voices, etc. Mm -hmm. We can sometimes solve in half an hour, mm -hmm. even if a person has been hospitalized for, for five years or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are still, there are two reasons why I call this the queen of therapies in my book. Mm -hmm. The first reason is. Never a dull moment. Okay. It's very lively, it's yeah. always interesting. And the second reason is it's so damned effective. Yeah. Not all things are solved in one session, and some people have to come in the course of time, many sessions, but are rare, are only very few people that need more than three sessions mm. to solve a specific problem. Yes. Oh. I love what I'm doing, yeah, and I'm discovering all the time more, and uh, happy clients, and also happy students. Of course, not all of them, but usually they do, yes. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, thank you very much, it has been very interesting, and you really have a beautiful place here. Thank you. It must have become dark now, not, not, not completely. So this was my interview with Hans den Damm. I hope you enjoyed it. I've also done an interview with Marion Bonn, a colleague of Hans and also an outstanding regression therapist. And I will post that interview also soon in my channel. So if you would like to get deeper into the topic of regression therapy, make sure to check out the links in the description to this video. I hope it was useful for you. And if it was, I'll be happy to receive a like for the video and a subscribe to my channel. Thanks for your interest and goodbye.